since we have the election coming up, I thought I'd go back in history and talk about uh, what I had done previously quite quite a few years ago. And that was a time when uh, Barack Obama was president. And 2011, I think the, uh, at least the House had, had uh, been captured by the Republicans. So there was a fellow named of Chris uh, Barnescu. I, I think he's probably East European, American citizen now, but East European at the time. And he lived under the communist uh, regime or the communist system back then. So he had plenty to say about it. And as I go through this, you'll see why it uh, pertains to today. Because, you know, we, uh, I don't know that we're actually trying to uh, embrace communism, but certainly, you know, with a certain segment of the uh, political spectrum, they're certainly trying to embrace uh, socialism. So, so this is uh, by Chris Banescu. He wrote this on July the 5th, 2011, which is the first two years of, of Obama's um, um, presidency. And he says, as a survivor of the communist holocaust, I, I am horrified to witness how my beloved America, my adopted country, is gradually being transformed into a secularist and atheist, atheistic utopia where communist ideals are glorified and promoted by Judeo-Christian values and morality are ridiculed and increasingly eradicated from the public and social consciousness of our nation. And it, I might say it's only gotten worse. Under the decades long assault and militant radicalism of many so-called liberal and progressive elites, God has been progressively erased from our public and educational institutions to be replaced with all manner of delusion, perversion, corruption, violence, decadence, and insanity. And I might say that, uh, uh, just a minute here, that um, it's really only got worse. We in a situation now where uh, virtue, at least in the public arena, is being ridiculed. We've, uh, uh, perversion is now uh, embraced as virtue and virtue is condemned as perversion. And there's a, if you, if you can see it, I have to get up close. <laughs> well, I can't show it to you, but uh, there's a book by uh, Gertrude, there it is. Gertrude Himmelfarb called The Demor Demoralization of Society. And it deals with this very subject comparing the Victorian virtues to uh, modern values, which there are not many of them. But anyway, uh, uh, it's, it's, he goes on to say, it's no coincidence that as Marcus, Marxist ideologies and secularist principles engulf culture and pervert mainstream thinking, individual freedoms and liberties are rapidly disappearing. Consequently, Americans feel increasingly more powerless and subjugated by some of the most radical and hypocritical least democratic and characterless individuals our society has ever produced. And I think you can just think about what's going on now and see that that really is the case. Those of us who have experienced and witnessed firsthand the atrocities and terror of communism understand fully why such evil takes root, how it grows and deceives and the kind of hell it will ultimately unleash on the innocent and faithful. Godless, godlessness is always the first step towards tyranny and oppression. In fact, I think it was George Washington said that uh, you can't have a democracy without uh, a belief in, in God. <coughs> Those of us who have experience in uh, Witness the atrocities and terror of communism, communism 
and uh, our hold on a second. Uh, godliness is always the first step towards tyranny and oppression. Nobel laureate, Orthodox Christian author, and Russian dissident Alexander Solzhenitsyn, in his um, address called Godliness. Godlessness, the first step to the gulag. It was given when he received the Templin Prize for Progress in Religion on May of 1983. He explained how the Russian Revolution and the communist takeover were facilitated by an atheistic mentality and a long process of secularization, which alienated people from God and traditional Christian morality and beliefs. He rightly concluded, men have forgotten God. That is why all of this happened. An excerpt from his, from the text of his Templeton address is, uh, will follow the parallels with the current crisis and moral decay in American society are striking and frightening. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear. And this is part of the address by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. If anybody wants to, you can't, I can't read the whole thing because it's just way too long. If anybody wants to read it, I have the uh, link. I can send that to you. Just, just let me know. He says more than half a century ago, while I was still a child, remember he wrote this in 83 or said this in 83. I recall hearing a number of older people offer the following explanation for the great uh, disasters that had befallen Russia. Men have forgotten God. That's why all this has happened. Since then, I have spent well now 50 years working on the history of our revolution. In the process, I have read hundreds of books collected hundreds of personal testimonies and have already contributed eight volumes of my own towards the effort of clearing away the rubble left by that upheaval. But if I were asked today to formulate as concisely as possible the main cause of the ruinous revolution that swallowed up some 60 million of our people, I could not put it more accurately than to repeat Men have forgotten God. That's why all this has happened. What is more, the events of the Russian Revolution can only be understood now, at the end of the century, against the background of what has since occurred in the rest of the world. What emerges here is a process of universal significance. And if I were called to identify briefly the principal trait of the entire 20th century, here too, I would be unable to find anything more precise and pithy than to repeat once again, men have forgotten God. Like I say, if you want to uh, read the entire article, drop me a note and I'll send you the link. Can it be said of today, uh, that as a society, we are becoming more secularized, that we have forgotten God. I think you can answer that question. As a society, we seem only to be interested in what we can get for ourselves. Anybody remember the think of the riots? Many have discovered and taken advantage of a foreboding reality. If you really work hard, apply yourself, and achieve financial success, the government will take a confiscatory amount of money from you in the form of taxes and fees. But if you don't work hard, don't make those hard choices and sacrifices to become financially independent, then the government will pay you. We used to be the land of the free and home of the brave. Now it seems we are the land of the fee and the home of the slave. Marxism, and I might also say uh, socialism, at its core uh, was an economic ideology. For it to work, the state must have control over the economic 
resources of the country embracing the ideology. But a necessary and consequential result is that religion must be destroyed or at least marginalized. Do we not see that happening today? And as a society, when we forget the God of the Bible, the only alternative is the God of the state. And the state loves to have it so. In fact, it must have it so. Now that the midterms elections are over, remember this is 2011, and the Republicans will now have control of both houses of the legislature, all that will change. He actually believed it was going to change. <laughs> so many physical and moral conservatives were are euphoric. But let me give you the good news and the bad news of this election. The good news is the Republicans have won. With that win, what is viewed by many as the destructive policies and general bumbling of the Democrats in general, and the president in particular, will be checked. Maybe then the federal government will establish sound fiscal policies and or limit the intrusiveness into almost every aspect of the everyday lives of the citizenry, and the people will look less to the government as a substitute to dependence on God. He said, now the bad news is the Republicans have won. They, in essence, have a two-year period to prove that they are motivated to work together to achieve some meaningful reforms in the way government conducts its business, limit the scope of the bloated federal bureaucracies or eliminate them altogether, restore independence to the citizenry, and hopefully allow spirituality to flourish again, once again. But I would say Republicans never seem to be able to do anything when they gain control of the houses. But we are not the first country to trust in man and forget God, nor will we be the last. We forget the saying of old recorded in Deuteronomy 8, 18 through 20, and you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. Then it shall be, if you by any means forget the Lord your God, <clears throat> and follow other gods, and serve them, and worship them, I testify you this day that you shall surely perish. As the nations which, which the Lord destroys before you, so you shall perish, because you would not be obedient to the voice of the Lord. Now, why is this not as applicable to the United States as it was to the heathen nations at the time Deuteronomy was written? <clears throat> but we see that Israel did forget God in 1 Samuel 8, chapter, 8, chapter verses 1 through 5. Now it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, the name of his second, Abijah. And they were judges in Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned after, side after dishonest gain, took bribes and perverted justice. Then all of the elders of the Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, look, you're old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Now keep in mind, God did authorize a king in Deuteronomy 17, chapter verses 14 through 20. And you, I'll just let you read that on your own. But he specified exactly what uh, uh, who they were select the king from and kind of what the king was going to do. In 1 Samuel, the first chapter, verse 6, for everything that was authorized in the Deuteronomy passage displeased Samuel. But the thing displeased Samuel, and they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. Now, the question is if the uh, office of a king were authorized, then exactly why was Samuel displeased? The Lord said to Samuel, heed the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me that I should reign over them. God intended to be the real king, 
the office of the earthly king would be subordinate to the heavenly king. He says in Deuteronomy, the 19th chapter, verses 5 and 6, Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. But Israel wouldn't have it that way. They, they had forgotten God in their demands. So God said in Hosea 13, uh, verse 11, I gave you a king in my anger and took him away in my wrath. It uh, was written in Acts 13, chapter verses 21 through 23. And afterward they asked for a king. So God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man of my, after my own heart, who will do my will, all my will. And from this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a savior. Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin. The Lord would not be descended from the tribe of Benjamin, but the tribe of Judah. So Saul was what, what the, was what the people wanted and got. He was not the king of promise. And how did that work out? Oftentimes, God grants us the desires of our prayers and at the same time obligates us to endure the consequences of those desires. As Friedrich A. Hayek, the noble winning economist said, is there a greater tragedy imaginable that in our endeavor consciously to shape our future in accordance with high ideals, we should in fact unwittingly produce the very opposite of what we've been striving for. Now say, uh, as a uh, formalist kind of say, you know, beware of what you wish for. Do not forget God. Anyway, so, uh, the Jews wanted a uh, king and, and uh, continue on, on in Samuel 8th chapter. God tells them the behavior of the king who would reign over them. And you, you go back and read that passage. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 8 through 9. And see if there are any parallels to uh, what's going on today. And it continues on through verse 22. And they said, uh, then after all these things take place, the king does what the king does. Then the people will cry out to no avail. Even a Republican victory will not abate the consequences of the people having forgotten God. <clears throat> Even knowing this, at least on an intellectual level, the people were insistent on having it their own way, whether they knew about it on an intellectual level hard to say. The people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. They said, I don't care what the king's going to do. We want a king. So they got it. And then we see all the troubles that ensued from that uh, decision. And it's essentially because they had forgotten God. They want to be like the people around them. But keep in mind that there must be in any sort of society there must be somebody in control if you don't have somebody in control then there's anarchy and even in uh, anarchy there will be someone in control eventually uh, or else destruction will ensue you think about the french revolution and the first directorate and then the citizens eventually became certain citizens that were more equal than the other citizens so it doesn't matter who's in power in Washington, Austin, Houston, or Jack in a Box. Someone or something must transcend all those centers of power. There's got to be some something over over all of them. Whether the men recognize it, or are ignorant of it, or are indifferent to it, there is always a greater power that is in control. I think we should keep that in mind. When we conclude that, 
and act in, in accordance with that reality, then many of the economic and political woes besetting us today do not reduce us to a bundle of nerves. Let's uh, do some reviewing here. <clears throat> in thanking God for revealing to him the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, Daniel confirmed who was really in control. In Daniel, the second chapter, verse 21, he says, and he, God, that is, changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. By this very simple statement, Daniel acknowledges that political power comes from God. They make rule contrary to divine will, and they can be removed. Even Nebuchadnezzar knew this, but did not always act in harmony with this knowledge. We know this because God confirmed this directly to Nebuchadnezzar when he passed judgment on the king's pride. In Daniel, the fourth chapter, verse 32, he said, And they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you. And you, you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whoever he chooses. And keep in mind that uh, when Nebuchadnezzar did this in those uh, ancient kingdoms like that, <clears throat> uh, there was always somebody trying to take the throne. And so you had to stay on top of it. But he wasn't for a period of a couple of years. But his, his uh, reign continued. He was preserved. But anyway, Paul affirmed... Uh, this in his writings in the 13th chapter, uh, first part of it, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities for there's no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God and those who resist uh, will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good and you will have praise and the same, for he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and adventure to execute wrath on him who practice, practices evil. Now, an interesting question I have, uh, uh, we all, at least uh, those that are older, know about Hitler and his reign where he ascended to the power in, in uh, Germany in 19... 33, I think it was, 32, 33. And Romans 13, uh, did that authorize the Nazi government in Germany? Well, yes, it did authorize that government, but it did not authorize the acts that they uh, uh, perpetrated on the, not only the people of Germany, the Jews and what have you, in the world. That was to be condemned and was condemned. But the government, the actual um, institution of government, even the Hitler government was authorized. But Jesus uh, now has the ultimate authority even over Nazi Germany. In Matthew 28, chapter verse 18, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He is head over all things. Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 20 through 22, says, uh, talking about things which uh, God worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, <clears throat> but also in that which is to come. He put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. And kind of like uh, idea in 1 Peter 3rd chapter verse 22, who is going into heaven and talking about Christ, is at the right hand of God, angels, 
and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Now, I might add, it does not matter uh, whether these uh, authorities and powers acknowledge that, they're still subject to him. In 1 Timothy 6.15, it says that uh, Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is he who is the blessed and only potentate King of kings and Lord of lords. He is truly the ruler of the kings of the earth. In Revelation 1 verse 5, we see that um, come out from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the first one from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. To him loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Regardless of who is in control of the White House, Congress, state houses, all the way down to the sometimes petulant, sometimes capricious, but always powerful bureaucrat, God is in ultimate control. If it is the case then, and it is, that God is in control, we must trust in his sovereignty and that he works for us. In Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. And further on down in verse 31 and 34, what, shall, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him who freely gives us all things? Who shall bring a, car, a charge against God's elect? And who, who is it that God justifies? Uh, if it, Christ who died, also risen, uh, who, he's even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God except ourselves. In Romans 8, chapter continuum, in 8, chapter verse 35 and 39, uh, who's going to separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation and distress or persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, or the results of an election that we don't uh, particularly like? Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. And on down to verse 39, who shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord? We may be citizens of the United States of America. Texas or some lesser state. <laughs> but we need to recognize that our true citizenship is in heaven. As declared by Paul to brethren who were Roman citizens, in Philippians 3rd chapter verse 20, he says, for our citizenship is in heaven. And we are fellow citizens with the saints in Ephesians 2.19 said, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. We are pilgrims uh, living, uh, living among the nations of men. In 1 Peter 1, 1, Peter said, uh, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, and so forth. In 1 Peter 2, verse 11, beloved, I beg you as sojourn sojourners and pilgrims, is stained from the fleshly laws which war against the soul. We are citizens of, of the kingdom of God first and foremost. Here we are just pilgrims. As citizens of the eternal of the eternal kingdom of heaven, does our sovereign God love and care for us? Well, he, he loved us so much that he sent Jesus his son to be the only sacrifice possible to save us from our sins. In 1 John 4, verses 10 through 11, he says, in this, uh, in this is love, that not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we all so ought to love one another. And God knows what we need. In Matthew, the sixth chapter, verses 25 through 32, 
Now I'll let you read that, but he says, you know, don't worry about your life. You know, look at the birds there. All these things are uh, provided for and not a hair falls and he doesn't know about it. He knows what you need. And you're more valuable than those in the animal kingdom. They're taken care of. So will you. In verse 31, he says, for your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. This world is temporary, as is this tabernacle of flesh. We are not to become too attached to this world, or else we become we come to love it more than our eternal home. In First John, the second chapter, verses fifteen through seventeen, it says, "Do not love the world or things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him." For all that is in the world, the lust of eyes, the lust of flesh, and pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Are we then, because God loves us, immune to the trials and tribulations of this world? <clears throat> in the parables of the soil, soils, God speaks of one who gladly received the word but stumble because of the tribulation and persecution that came up upon him by reason of embracing the world itself, the word, the word itself. In Matthew, the 13th chapter, verses 20 through 21, but he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. The so-called rich young ruler became very sorrowful in hearing what he must do with the inherited eternal life. Jesus commented on how hard it was for one rich in this world's possessions to enter the kingdom of heaven. Peter, perhaps a little too boldly, said that the apostles had left all in order to follow him, to which Jesus responded in Mark the 10th chapter, verses 29 and 30, it said, he said, surely I say to you, there is no one who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. Do you really desire to live a godly life? Then expect persecutions of some sort. In 2 Timothy 3rd chapter verse 12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will, without exception, suffer persecution. As citizens of the heavenly realm, then what then should be our primary primary duty to our sovereign? Well, uh, first of all, seek first the rule or reign of God in your lives. In Mark 6, chapter verse 33, first we all know well, if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And we must have proper respect for our sovereign in doing his will and fulfilling our duty as good citizens. In Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. For fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. And in the original wording actually says, this is man's all. This is what constitutes man. Seeking first the kingdom of God is our primary mission. And the way to do that is to fear him and keep his commandments. The way to the Father is through Jesus. And in John 14, verse 6, <clears throat> Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Well, that's uh, all I have for tonight. Uh, if anyone has any questions, 